All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. How's it going? Thank you. It's going great. <laughs> uh, so today we have Diego Sayez Gil of Pachama from the Winter 19 batch and Gustav Alstromer, who is a partner at YC. So today we're here to talk about Diego's company. Uh, Gustav, why don't you start it out? Sure. Um, so I met Diego probably about a year and a half ago now. And um, our paths crossed in sort of like the in interest for um, carbon removal. Um, I don't know if you call it French um, science anymore, French sort of like area, but it certainly crossed in the area of trying to solve climate change and how you can use technology to solve, solve climate change. And it's something that we at YC have spent quite a bit of time on. Uh, back in about a year ago, we released a carbon request for startup, carbon removal request for startup, mm -hmm. which is um, a way for us to inspire people that work on new companies, uh, what to work on. And we present a bunch of, bunch of ideas there of things that people can work on. Um, Diego has a very interesting approach to his company and love to hear more. Um, but he is, this is not his first company. Um, so maybe before we get into Pachama, tell us about your background. Like you've been funded, you funded a couple of different companies in the past. Um, maybe what's the journey, how you got here today? Sure. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, Let's see, I grew up in Argentina, in the north of Argentina, uh, always surrounded by nature, where I'm from. Uh, it's, you know, the Yungas, which is the last tip of the Amazon uh, type rainforest in the north of Argentina. And then I had this big curiosity to travel the world. I wanted to see what was out there. Argentina is so far away from everything <laughs> that, you know, I want to uh, travel and see. So after finishing school, I got a scholarship to do a master's in Barcelona, moved from Argentina to Barcelona took advantage to travel as a backpacker all across Europe. And then that journey led me to New York City to do an internship. And uh, there I decided to start a company, Yeah, which was kind of insane because at the time I was broke. I didn't speak good English. I didn't know anybody in the US and I had no <laughs> idea how to start a startup. Uh, but I did it. And the first startup was trying to solve the problem that I had at the time as a backpacker. So we built a mobile app to book hostels and bed and breakfast. And uh, at the beginning, it was really hard because I had no idea, but eventually we raised some capital and eventually we sold the company to a company called Student Universe that sold discounted flights for students. Um, after, right after that, I went to Argentina to visit my family and I lost a suitcase uh, on that trip. <laughs> and that led to uh, the next idea, which was how come there is no suitcases that you can track? And with a friend in New York, we decided to you know, uh, launch a crowdfunding campaign and started Blue Smart, which is a company with which we applied to Y Combinator and got selected in uh, winter 15. Oh, wow. That led me to California. And uh, building a hardware company was a completely new adventure for me, really difficult. You Did know, you have any to, background building hardware before? Or? Not at all. Oh. Uh, my co-founder told me he had been to China sourcing merchandising, but uh, I, had, I haven't ever been to China. Um, and we moved after, right after YC, we moved to Hong Kong. We opened an office there and we started, you know, going to Shenzhen every week. This company flew quite high. We raised a lot of capital thanks to YC and thanks to the traction that we were having. You know, we're selling a lot of our products. Um, and, you know, grew the team to over 60 people um, and everything was going great. Although always with a lot of challenges, like every hardware company, up until the airlines decided to ban lithium ion batteries because the Samsung phones were getting on fire on airplanes, which is something you cannot expect as a startup to be, yep. you know, have your products banned by what, what airlines. Was the, what was the vision for the company? Like, like what were we trying? Yeah, I mean, the vision was to uh, use technology to make travel better. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't like this a grand vision to improve the world, to be honest. And uh, were you the first company to like embed a battery in the suitcase or? We were, yes. You were, we and were, now it's we sort of like standard, every single Yeah, a lot of, to... you know, other great companies came afterwards, you know, bringing innovation to luggage, yeah. which, you know, by the way, to me, the biggest lessons that I got from that startup was that you can introduce a new idea into the world and this idea can spread as a meme and then you have a new category in the planet. Wow. Uh, a conversation in a coffee shop in New York City can turn into a multi hundred million dollar category. And I was like, wow, okay, we have that power. <laughs> Why don't we put it to good use to solve one of the you know, biggest problems that humanity faces today? So anyways, 
that company ended up in this you know very difficult situation we were able to sell the assets of the company the technology and the ip um but but the company didn't end in a in a in a, in a good exit so after that i decided to you know take some time off did a lot of soul searching um went with my two brothers to the amazon rainforest spent some time with some native communities there got incredibly inspired by the power of nature and also got incredibly heartbroken seeing deforestation happening there in the in the border of the amazon and, and civilization um then moved here to the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, where I live now among the redwoods, and from there started th researching and thinking what I was going to do next. Um, and climate change and the environmental crisis was my biggest concern. Um, and at the same time, I had this, this inspiration by the forest where I had been. Uh, and I, reading a book, I discovered or, or I learned the potential that reforestation and forest conservation has to capture carbon at scale in the planet and is one of the most important solutions to climate change that nobody is talking about at the time. This is uh, two years uh, yep. and a half ago. And um, so then that led me to research, you know, how technology could enable that solution. And uh, decided to come back to the road, even though I was, you know, uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, still, I guess, uh, broken by the previous experience, but I was like, okay, everything I learned, I need to put it at the service of this, which I think is the biggest problem of our generation. And then I went and I talked to you and you received me and I drew in a whiteboard uh, the idea and you told me, this is a really good idea, go for it. Um, and I can tell you what the idea is now with that <laughs> <Yeah>. introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the background of how I got to Pachama. So t tell us what Pachama does. I mean, there's there's um, a lot of people have ideas of how to solve climate change. Um, I believe the technology will be absolute at the core um, of solving it. Like most big problems the humanity have faced in the past, technology have somewhat helped solve. Yeah. Um, so maybe tell me about Pachama. What does it do? Um, sounds like a good idea to plant trees, but like, in what way do you do you change yeah. that? So the first question that we ask was, okay, if reforestation and forest conservation is such a big solution and such an easy solution, we know how to plant trees, why we're not doing it? And the answer to that is, okay, somebody has to pay for that. You know, we, we're not driving funding to do it. There is not an economic incentive to do it today. And the mechanism that was created by the United Nations to create an incentive uh, to drive solutions to climate change is carbon markets. Carbon markets work in the following way. The companies and organizations that are emitting CO2 into the atmosphere should take responsibility for those emissions and should compensate those emissions. And the way to do it is through an instrument that was created called carbon credits uh, that are given to projects that reduce emissions or recapture carbon from the atmosphere. Now, that's a market that had some grown, at the, uh, you know, growth at the beginning, and then after the financial crisis kind of crash, but after the Paris Agreement, the market is growing again. And according to the World Bank, last year, over $80 billion went into carbon market initiatives around the world. And yet, when you look at the percentage of that funding that is going to forest conservation and restoration, is less than 2%. So the, then the question that we ask is, okay, why that's the case? And we learned that there were two problems. Number one, if you want to certify a forest project today, let's say that you want to plant trees, you have a land and you want to you know, uh, do reforestation or do forest conservation, you have to do a certification process that takes two years and it costs between 100 and 400,000 dollars because you have to get auditors sent to your field to count trees and measure the size of the trees every certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And that is very inefficient. So as a result, there aren't that many projects. In the US, there are less than 50 projects that got certification for carbon credits. And in South America, there is less. And you, you, you know, the only projects are very large projects. Um, in the other hand, buyers of carbon offsets, uh, in a way, stayed away from forest because of a lot of lack of credibility about the projects. You know, how do I know that someone is planting a tree? How do I know that the calculation is being correct? How do I know I'm not going to get in trouble if there is a problem in the project? Mm -hmm. was, so, was fraud common? 
It's not common, but okay. it happened sometimes. Okay. And there were people that took advantage of carbon credits because they're such an abstract concept. Um, and there were some problems with projects in which illegal deforestation happened, uh, maybe you know, uh, not uh, under the awareness or control of the project developers, but something that, that happened and, and, and were problems in the past. Was, so, the, was the problems related to it was hard to track things right. or was the problems related to that the system was broken? Yeah, hard to track, hard to yeah. uh, process that information in real time. It's just you know sort of like a technology problem, right? Right. Uh, not an intentional problem, uh, you know, in, in the most part. So here's where we come with a technological solution to all these problems. What we're doing is two things. First, we are using the latest on remote sensing and artificial intelligence to do our uh, verification and monitoring of how much carbon is there on a forest and how much carbon the forest is going to capture. What do you mean by remote sensing? Remote sensing includes satellite images, LIDAR data, and any form of uh, data that can be collected remotely and then analyzed with algorithms. And, and then we use uh, machine learning algorithms, and, and I can go later into specifics of how we do it, to analyze those uh, data points of the forest and you can be incredibly precise today at estimating carbon storage and, and carbon capture by mm -hmm. forest. Uh, so those tools will help facilitate the certification of projects. Uh, they increase the credibility of the projects. They allow for constant monitoring and they bring a uh, whole new transparency and efficiency to the onboarding of new projects. Uh, and then the second part of what we're doing is we are trying to connect the parts in a more direct way. Because today, companies that want to purchase carbon offsets, they generally have to go to brokers. The brokers get their credits from you know, a trader, the trader maybe from a retailer, the retailer from a, you know, a, a lot of middlemen along the way. And if we are going to be onboarding these projects and doing this data analysis, why don't we connect directly the projects with the buyers. So in a way, we're building a marketplace as well that allows for companies and organizations that want to offset their carbon emissions to directly access trustworthy carbon credits coming from forest restoration and conservation around the world. And your platform allows me to know exactly what forest that I am, uh, right. where the carbon credits is, is stored? Exactly. You can enter the platform. You can see different projects around the world. You can see exactly where it's located. You can see satellite images that get updated on a, on a frequent basis. You can see photos of the forest. You can see how everything was tested, a uh, description of the co-benefits. Because by the way, one important thing about forests is that not only they capture carbon, but they are holders of biodiversity, wildlife, water conservation, community uh, impacts, you know, job generation. So it's a very holistic solution solution to many ecological problems. And all that is described on the way that we display the projects on our platform. So, so I think one thing that might be interesting to kind of give this a little context is to talk about magnitudes. Yeah. So for an average, I mean, we don't have to talk about specific customers, but like for an average company, how much land are we talking? What are, how much carbon are they trying to offset? Yeah, so for so it's a good question because there are many companies that are for the first time evaluating, you know, becoming carbon neutral, offsetting their emissions, and turns out that it's not that expensive. It turns out that for certain companies, for example, service companies or software companies, their emissions are mainly the electricity consumption in their offices and their travels of their employees. Uh, there is an estimation that, that you know for a company like that is about six tons per employee per year the emission and today you know prices prices of carbon uh, credits range between five and twenty dollars so it's not a lot of money to per completely ton? per ton okay yeah so per the year. offset an employee uh, in all of its so like emissions it's. 50 bucks or, it or could be, 100 dollars yeah, yeah. between 50 and, and 150 dollars uh, per employee per year for a service company wow. uh, at that at that price level um, and how much land is that just for context so let's see one hectare of land uh, of full grown forest uh, contains about 200 tons uh, okay now you know the, the 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 carbon credits get issue in terms of how much additional carbon a forest project captures so that depends there are different type of projects I, I can explain but um, but yeah we have projects that uh, it, it, it's interesting the question because we want to start presenting this as 
you know, by offsetting your emissions, you are protecting 10 soccer fields of forest, yeah, yeah. right? Or, you know, 50 soccer fields of forest. And we have, in fact, um, we, we're working on presenting tranches so companies can choose, okay, I want to participate in this tranche that is going to offset even beyond my uh, our, our footprint and focus on the protection that we're doing and not just on the carbon offsetting. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so we talked a lot about tons of CO2. So that's the typically the unit that people are using to measure uh, carbon emissions. Um, the world is emitting 35 or 40 gigatons a year. That's an enormous right. amount. Can you talk about just like the opportunity of foresting? Like how big is the like yeah. is this opportunity? Because I remember there's an, there's a venture firm, Bill Gates um, investment firm, Breakthrough Energy Ventures. They say they would only invest in things that have a minimum opportunity of, I think it's like, one gigaton or one and a half mm -hmm, gigaton or mm -hmm. half a percent. So some some large number, mm -hmm. which means that everything you have to go after has to be really large. Yeah. How large is the opportunity in forests? Yeah, so there was a paper published recently by a university in Switzerland that did an estimation of the potential for reforestation. And the numbers are like this. There is about 1 billion hectares in the planet that are available for forest restoration without competing with agriculture. In that land, you can uh, plant about a trillion trees, and that trillion trees has the potential to draw down about 200 gigatons of carbon, not of CO2, of carbon. Mm -hmm. So the CO2 is you know times 3.6. Yep. Um, that is about two thirds of the emissions that we put in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Um, wow. So we're talking about probably the most meaningful solution, and this is discounting, not not counting forest restoration, uh, forest conservation, which is the standing forest that we have today, especially the rainforest that capture a lot of carbon, right? In Amazon, in Borneo, in Congo, um, that we should stop deforesting right now because these forests continue to capture carbon over their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's, it's, uh, these are meaningful numbers. And, and the, the main problem is missing is that the, the incentives aren't there. Is, it, is the incentives aren't... Um, that don't exist or they're not available to most of those uh, landowners. Exactly, they're not available because you know the carbon market, you know, the flow of capital going to carbon markets is growing mm -hmm. fifty percent year over year since wow. the Paris Agreement, and we hope that will continue to grow as more regulations come into place. For example, all the airlines starting in twenty twenty one will have to offset their emissions. This is by regulations, right? Hmm. So it's called the Corsia framework, yeah, and. We are talking about uh, uh, about 160 million tons per year mm -hmm. that are going to be demanded by that market. So the demand for carbon offsets will continue to grow. And our intention is to make it easier for that funding to go to reforestation and forest conservation. And in the future, other nature-based solutions, because beyond forest, there is, you know, uh, what's called blue carbon, which is restoring coral reefs and, you know, uh, kelp forest and mangrove forests in waters. There is uh, regenerative agriculture, which is another form of land-based uh, carbon capture um, and, and so forth, right? Yep. So um, the, the, we hope that in the next few decades, hundreds of billions of dollars will go to solving climate change mm -hmm. as we realize the importance of this and the urgency. And there will be a need for a platform that transparently, efficiently, um, and effectively transfer that capital to the right solutions. And, and we hope to be that platform. Maybe we can dive in on the trust question. So, so um, there, there's a history of people not fully trusting carbon offsets. Yeah. Why do you think that happened? And sort of like, what is the difference between a carbon offset and a carbon credit? And how do you make sure that you build in trust in your system so that we can change that narrative? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the reason uh, people didn't trust them is because lack of transparency and lack of data, mm -hmm. right? It was a very uh, paper trail type of industry. Mm -hmm. um, and we are trying to change that. We're trying to make it a digital asset in which you can trace digitally everything from how a credit was issued, how it was calculated, how it's monitored, and how it's traded. That should happen online, like every other industry that received, you know, the internet treatment, right? So kind of like, like Airbnb, you can go and find every single place around the world. And, exactly. and as, an, as, a, as a homeowner or landowner, I can figure out what the value of my land is on the carbon markets. Exactly. Yeah. So 
So uh, the, 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 the lack of trust was because of lack of transparency and data and information. Uh, and that's going to change. Um, and just a specific question. How do you make sure that something isn't double counted? How do you make sure that someone isn't on your platform and another platform at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are these registries and the registries are in a way cross, uh, accounted. Um, but there's definitely a need for more um, transparency tools and more technology tools, frankly, for these registries to assure that everything is uh, uniquely accounted. Um, there is also the issue of uh, the national contributions to uh, the commitments towards the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. in which a country can claim the carbon capture of a forest and yep. maybe inside of that land there is a, a particular private project that also got carbon credits. So you have to assure that, that you account for that. Um, and again, it's just about data Yep. and making the data accessible and standardized. Got it. Um, so, so one follow-up question here. So, so what's the difference between re reforestation, afforestation? And yeah. also one common concern people have about uh, forest capture and carbon is that forests eventually die or eventually mm. um, the burn or whatever, natural costs of, mm -hmm. of carbon being re-emitted into the atmosphere. Reversals, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, there are four type of forest projects and, and, and more broadly, but uh, there is... Forest conservation, which is you have a standing forest, and what you do is you commit not to cut it down. That's what's needed in the Amazon rainforest, for example, mm -hmm. right? We need to pay people not to cut down the forest because there is an alternative that is cutting down the forest to do cattle ranching or to do agriculture, and that's a big economic pressure on the Amazon rainforest. Secondly, there is what's called improved forest management. That's very common here in North America. These are forests in which uh, timber logging was uh, done. And basically the commitment is to do a more uh, regenerative type of uh, harvesting in which you harvest every a couple of decades, you replant trees, you re-enrich the forest. And, and you can continue you know, harvesting timber, but with a more sustainable practice. Mm -hmm. Number three is uh, reforestation and it's just planting trees in a place where there used to be a forest in the past. And afforestation is to plant trees in a place where there wasn't a forest in the past. So you have to prepare the soil. It's like basically decertifying uh, or, 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 you know, sort of like a, a converting a desert into an, a, a place where a forest can exist. Way more difficult to do. Um, and, and we kind of, you know, uh, don't need to go there because yep. there's a lot of, you know, uh, places available for restoration. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point we could, you know, we, we have an engineering capacity to you know, geoengineering and mod modify, you know, environments, you know, so powerfully as we did with civilization, mm -hmm. we could, you know, easily a forest, um, you know, for example, I don't know, the Sahara Desert even. Wow. So in, in terms of differences between these methods, are there certain benefits to log sustainably? For instance, like, is a new tree giving off more or like capturing more than an old tree? It depends on the species. It, is, it depends on, 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 on the climate of the region. It depends on a lot of things. Um, but um, all growth forests continue to capture carbon. Um, the Borneo forest that has millions of years continues to capture carbon. And while a, a forest, like every living uh, ecosystem and organism, dies out and regenerates, and when a tree dies out, yes, it releases some carbon, the net uh, result is actually carbon capture. And there is there is a lot of data that, that supports that claim. Um, that being said, wood is a very sustainable material, way more sustainable than concrete or other materials. So we should continue having tree plantations and harvesting for wood generation. And I think that doing improved forest management on, on timber areas mm. is, is an important practice in which we are optimizing for both, for carbon capture and for uh, wood production. Hmm. So, so to that end, a question Gustav had written down. Um, sometimes are the incentives misaligned in the sense that farmers just want to create monocultures of crops? Like, hey, here, I can generate the most lumber with this type of tree. Right. And yeah, do they go for that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's been the case, uh, definitely in agriculture and in the timber industry. Um, and hopefully this creates an incentive not to do that. You know, in an improved forest management, biodiversity is tested as well. So, um, and, and you know, it, 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 with data, we can, like, for example, with remote sensing data, with satellite images, we can determine markers of biodiversity that then can be accounted into the system. So as a buyer of carbon, if I, is that a choice I have to say, I don't, I want to make sure that the forest that I buy to capture carbon is diverse, is diverse, have biodiversity? Is that a choice I make or is that a choice that you make on your platform? Um, 
I mean, right now, the protocols that are out there to issue carbon credits have tests for mm -hmm. biodiversity. It's one of the questions that you have to answer for. Um, uh, in the future, we hope to, you know, uh, present uh, proposals for new protocols. That's something we can talk about in, in which, you know, all the available data gets accounted on the amount of credits that the project gets and the biodiversity should have uh, a, a, a weight there. Uh, but also, yes, buyers... Uh, can and they do prefer projects that protect wildlife, that have biodiversity benefits, because it's just it's not just about carbon offsetting, right? Got it. Um, so you co-founded Tomas is a machine learning engineer from Bran Branch National, like a, a lending company. Um, talk to me how you guys use technology. So like like yeah. there's a lot of tech and and sort of like the the data sources that you get. Just talk to me basic of the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, Tomas is a machine learning engineer and we're you know, building an amazing team on machine learning. We have a forest scientist with uh, expertise on machine learning and we just hired a PhD in math that solve uh, an unsolved geometrical problem uh, that uh, you know made his name on, on on the math world, and he's a machine learning engineer as well. And what we do is we are using a deep learning technique called convolutional neural networks that basically uh, analyzes uh, lidar data, mm -hmm. clouds of points of the forest that were collected by urban or by drones or by satellite, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in a way takes account of the shape of the forest and based on that can know how much biomass is there in the forest. We train the algorithms with ground truth of plots that were measured by you know, forest services, uh, you know, measuring the trees. And then you train the model and the model learns to detect, you know, given a certain shape, how much carbon is there. Wow. And we demonstrated, this is a work of uh, Elias, who is the PhD that works with us. Uh, for four years, he was working on this. Um, and he demonstrated an, in New England, less than 1.5% error at predicting how much carbon is there in a forest comparing... By looking the, at LIDAR or by looking at satellite? So you train the model with LIDAR mm -hmm. and then you apply it to satellite. And so I'm very yeah. curious, like, how do you account for the biodiversity in the model? Because I understand, so if you're mapping like altitudes, yeah. that's one thing, but you know, just, yeah. How, how can you tell well, different types of trees? Tree concentration, for example, is a marker of biodiversity. Okay. You know, where, you know, where there are many trees concentrated, uh, there is, there's more wildlife, for example. I'm not an expert on that, but yeah. you know, this is you know, some things that I'm, I'm, I'm picking up. So you can train the algorithm also to learn where there is more, more uh, biodiversity and more, uh, you know, canopy shape also tells you species group. Okay. So we can determine whether it's conifers or non-conifers, things like that. But ultimately you still kind of need a little bit of ground truth yeah. to know it's like, okay, in this type of environment, you know, these types of trees might be there. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what are the big technical challenges right now for you guys? So, I mean, data collection, uh, we partner with the two largest satellite companies uh, in the world and we're, you know, sourcing really good imagery from them. But we also, uh, you know, benefit from collecting LiDAR data uh, that's already out there, you know, uh, and ground truth, mm -hmm. you know, again, full, uh, field plots, uh, measurements. Uh, so, yes, we are very hungry for data. Uh, the more data we have, the better the algorithms become. Uh, we're very excited about... Uh, a NASA program called JEDI. They sent a LIDAR to the International Space Station and they've been collecting LIDAR cloud points uh, of forests around the planet. They're going to be releasing this data now in November. We're going to be the first to jump into that data. If the data is good, we can expand our model to the entire planet. Wow. So, yeah, from, from a technical perspective on the verification and monitoring side, it's just data. Um, but we are... And da data is available equally around the world? or like Yeah, the, but sometimes it sits on, you know, the forest service of a country, right? Uh, got here, it. the U.S. Forest Service has been very, you know, open, sharing data with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we obtain a lot of data from Mexico. Uh, we're in the process of obtaining data from Peru and Brazil. So, yeah. Got it. Um, so your company is less than a year old. Mm-hmm. You've scaled up pretty fast. Where are you today? Just give us sort of like roughly an idea how far along you are and sort of like what are the, sure. the bottlenecks from growing even faster is a common question we ask YC companies when they're in the, <laughs> yeah. in the bash, but there's always something that prevents you from growing even faster. Yeah, I mean, we did accomplish a lot in just one year. At the same time, I feel that we should go faster, we should be <laughs> accomplishing more, but that's always a sensation, I guess, for an entrepreneur. Um, we, uh, 
we build this model that works very well in North America uh, and uh, you know, starting to expand to South America. We partner with some of the largest forest project developers in these two regions. Uh, we onboarded over 10 forest projects uh, in the US and Brazil into our platform that we analyzed, validated, and you know, listed on our platform. Um, we have closed over 10 customers wow. and we are in the process of closing some very big companies that are already purchasing carbon offsets and that they loved our approach. Uh, I cannot, you know, say names yet, but you know, uh, these are very, you know, recognizable uh, companies that um, that have a high standard on everything they do. So, um, and who who generally are the buyers of this? Like, like you mentioned, like the compliance markets are eighty eighty billion dollars. Like, like is it is this? Mostly yeah. corporations or is it countries or individuals? Who are the buyers? Countries purchase carbon offsets at scale, mm -hmm. but uh, it's mainly yeah corporations. Uh, corporations that are regulated uh, in this market are energy companies, for example, mm -hmm. um, transportation companies. But then there is a big and growing voluntary market of companies, technology companies, um, you know, brands that uh, uh, sustainability is a big part of their value proposition, and then they decide to take responsibility for their carbon emissions. Becoming carbon neutral is a thing now. Yeah. And all the sustainability departments on these companies are talking about it. Maybe talk about like how the, the volunteer and the compliance kind of fit together. Because like I imagine that the more the more volunteer the carbon offsets there is, eventually that will lead to the compliance or like, yep, this is something that we should be doing or 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 yeah. How, how do corporations think about this? Is this something like we got to do is now because eventually it'll be compliance. We got to get ready for it. Or are they like this is what our customers or employees are demanding? How do you, what what are the the big the big ones like? Yeah. Why are they doing this? Yeah. For example, airlines are in the in the case that they are going to be regulated in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, and yet many have started already offsetting their emissions and even offering their customers to offset their trips. You know, for example, Delta and United have the the, op the option to to offset your flight. Uh, it's not super easy to do it on their website. We hopefully, we're going to help them with <laughs> that. that. Uh, but uh, but but that's the case. And then yes, here in Silicon Valley, um, you know, uh, employees, customers, and investors are asking companies, "What are we doing about climate change and offsetting your emissions?" Of course, first you have to reduce, try to use you know renewable energy, and then offset what you cannot uh, reduce. So is that what you think the future of the market is? It, it's just going to be companies like making bulk changes versus individuals saying like, you know, I'm going to offset one flight at a time. I think it's going to be everything. It's going to be governments, regulated uh, industries. It's going to be voluntary companies and it's going to be consumers as well. Uh, I do think that consumers um, will have to vote with their dollars and we'll have to also take care of, we, we have to all take responsibility for our footprint. At the end of the day, companies are just creating products and services that we consumers consume, right? So, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so, one thing I want to talk about is fundraising. So, so um, after we put our request to startup, we got lots of people reaching out to YC. It was a combination of, it was founders that want to start companies, N not that many of them, unfortunately. A lot of people wanted to work for these companies. There was like dozens of engineers at big companies that were like, which of the companies you have funded should I go and work for? And like, we didn't have that many for software engineers at the time. Uh, and then there was investors mm -hmm. and who wanted to learn many of them. And then there was pre people that from the press. And there was like, this is the, one of the, I think the probably the, the request, for start, request for startup that gen uh, generated the most amount of press interest of anything we ever done. Oh. Still got, are, are getting it, pings about this. Um, maybe tell us your experience on the fundraising side. So like you went out and fundraised, you had fundraised in the past and you kind of knew a little bit how, how, how this went, but you're raising money for a company that's fixing climate change. It's like, what categories are like, do they put you and do you put them, the investors, and what did you learn about fundraising through the process? Yeah, um, I was surprised by the fact that this time was my easiest fundraise. Hmm. And I was able to attract the best investors in, in my entrepreneurial history. Um, and I think the reason was that uh, smart and accomplished investors see that uh, climate change being one of the biggest challenges of humanity is also one of the biggest opportunities of value creation for society and therefore the opportunity to create valuable companies. Um, I think that the, the vision that we described uh, resonated with many investors and um, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we ended up racing almost twice as much as, uh, as we wanted to race initially uh, from an amazing group of people. Uh, our lead investor is Ryan Graves, the co-founder of Uber, um, he, who has experience building a global marketplace. Uh, we got investment from Chris Saka, who you know, funded uh, Uber at the beginning, uh, PG invested, and uh, we got you know, uh, investments from social capital, global Founders Capital, um, and even some small checks from you know funds like Axel and Atomico, and all those investors I, I guess saw on us uh, that we have first a strong technological component on the machine learning verification, and then strong network effects on the platform on the marketplace, and the potential to scale to be a very large platform. Uh, provided that humanity awakens to the reality <laughs> of climate change and mm -hmm. the need to uh, act on it. Um, so I guess what I learned uh, from that fundraising experience is that there is a lot of interest of investors uh, on climate change startups. Did you have to educate them about the solutions or like through the fundraising sure. or, or where, did they come with a lot of prior, prior knowledge? No, no, definitely. I mean, I had to, you know, share all this, all this information that I didn't have myself, you mm -hmm. know, at the beginning of this process, how current credits work, you know, what's the potential of forests and so forth. Uh, but they saw it quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, so yeah, I validated there's a lot of interest. Many of the investors I talked to keep asking me, do you have other cool companies working on climate change? So there is a lot of interest. Uh, you have to have a business model that is scalable, um, I think in that sense, YC was super useful for us on putting the Silicon Valley playbook lens into this company and, and, and avoid us to being trapped into a science project or a nonprofit project. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're a technology startup. We had to be scalable. We had to be defensible. We had to, you know, be um, uh, a product that people want, make something people want. I mean, so this is funny. So it kind of boils down to the exact same thing as before. Right. Like you, you aren't pitching this in any way differently than Blue Smart. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, well, I think the, I don't know, the overwhelming notion is that you have to pitch something differently if you're like trying to save the planet, right? No. If you're, but yeah. you're not. Uh, most you just people, made a good business. Well, I mean, I had to say something. To every investor that entered the company, I told them before accepting their money look, okay, now you're convinced that this is a good business. I want to tell you, this is a long term company. It's mission driven. Always the mission is going to be before profits, and it's going to take time. You know, we're trying to build. You know, uh, solve a big problem. So, if you're not okay with that, don't invest. And some people didn't invest, uh, but the majority love that because they saw the commitment that we have. And you know, really good companies take time, hmm. and really good companies are mission driven. So, yeah. Um, so, so one, I mentioned after the re request was started from YC, we got a lot of engineers pinging us or like, what can I do? And those like, mostly software engineers. I'm curious what advice you have for, uh, I, I'm sure there are lots of people like this who work in a big tech company. They're a data scientist, engineer, designer, product manager, and they want to work on climate change. Like, what do you typically advise them when you, um, when you meet them? Um, I have met many of these people and I struggle sometimes with sort of like what, where to point them because the number of software companies isn't that large. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the number one thing I advise them is to apply to Pachama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're, you know, we're not hiring that many people yet, uh, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I wish there were more companies to point people to. Um, I do encourage people to start their own companies. I encourage people to to look for, um, you know, the, the few startups that are out there and go and help. And uh, and I think that also within big companies, you can try to find your place in a, in in an area that is working on, on climate change. You know, big companies like Google and you know Microsoft and Apple all have uh, an area of focus on climate change. So go and work there, right? And learn there or contribute there. Um, and 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 even from governments, from nonprofit organizations, there's a lot of places in which we can contribute. Maybe a follow-up question there. So let's say I'm a software engineer and I wanted to start a company working on this. Um, do you have any specific areas that you think software is very needed on right now when it comes to climate change? I think that AI plus X uh, 
there is a lot of opportunities uh, to solve climate change. I actually made a list. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on, on, on making write, writing a blog post at some point. But just to give you a few examples, uh, AI plus optimization of uh, shipments, AI plus optimization of travel and you know air uh, you know air travel, AI plus uh, safety of nuclear plants, AI plus uh, smart cities, AI plus uh, smart electric grid. Uh, AI plus uh, Be because these are such complex things that humans can't aren't exactly, good enough to actually exactly. make decisions there. Uh, uh, efficient agriculture. We should be being way smarter about how we produce the food that we produce. Uh, so I think there is a lot of uh, software opportunities on on making the use of re resources and planet Earth uh, more efficient. And so r related to researching ideas to potentially starting a company, yeah. you know, you don't have like deep domain expertise. You know, you kind of got right. excited about this and you yeah. went off on your own. How would you suggest someone begin their own like research process? Like yeah. how do they start reaching out to people? Where do they go? Where do they find this information? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, um, well, the first thing I did differently in this company was I took longer on the research phase. And that was super important, to be honest. I think in, my f in the first companies, it was okay to just jump into the pool because, you know, that, you know, that naivete also helped me get started. But I do think that taking about a year to just research and read books and talk to experts and discard ideas is, is super important. That's what, what, what happened to me this time. And Experts are incredibly open, at, you know, to talk with with you know people that want to contribute. Are you talking like public sector, private sector professors, Everything. university like professors, uh, researchers at labs, um, even executives at companies? Um, my experience been that people want to you know want to help. So. So yeah, I mean, just come up with ideas and go and talk to people. And you don't have to be an expert. Um, that's the thing about entrepreneurship. You just have to be <laughs> good at attracting, you know, resources, right? Absolutely. Um, so, so I have one last question I want to ask on on here. Um, so so most startups don't have to spend too much time thinking about policy and governments. Um, they're sort of like, there's not really a priority for them. I'm sure this is something that is important for you because such a lot of this is regulated and... Um, policy and government decisions probably go in your favor in the future. There's probably more of this, not less. Um, just what do you, what's the, what do you hope to see sort of like in that angle? Yeah, I mean, definitely we are acting as if there's not going to be any change in regulation mm -hmm. and still this is going to be a big market. Mm -hmm. Yet we do think that uh, there should be more regulations that many, the big polluters, energy companies, transportation companies, industrial companies should have uh, an obligation to offset their emissions. And that's going to be an incentive for them to transition out of fossil fuels, right? So, uh, yes, I'm always paying attention to the different, you know, uh, initiatives like cap and trade markets or, um, you know, carbon tax initiatives in different places around the world. And my opinion is that, yes, this is what happened with aerosol, right? And the ozone uh, hole, we fix it with regulations and also we fix it with regulations, slavery and torture and genocide, right? So things that are wrong have to have a regulatory framework uh, to fade them out. Um, so I do think that free markets are great, but at the same time, you know, uh, the role of uh, you know, regulations on a capitalistic society mm -hmm. is to bring society to where everyone wants to go. Awesome. So just a couple quick questions from Twitter before we wrap up. Sure. So Guillermo asks, what are some of the most important things you've, um, you've already learned about the problem space since starting the company? Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that uh, we learn a lot about the importance of all the different players that are out there in the market. For example, there are these you know, registries that create standards and protocols, and they're super important because they've been studying this for, for many years. So we are going and partnering with them, uh, trying to make them improve their protocols or put our technologies at the service of their protocols and standards. Um, we learn, um, I guess, uh, that the, the importance of education, you know, frankly, this is a market that's very confusing, you know, so I didn't have as a part of our strategy to have a content strategy, but now I realize that content is going to be super important. We need to create more awareness and more clarity. Um, 
and definitely we'll learn, learn a lot about uh, the data part. Um, we learn about you know uh, how remote sensing is exponentiating um, uh, the possibilities of capturing data about ecosystems. That's something that gets me really, really excited because one vision that we have for Pachama is that we can become this kind of like uh, platform for understanding deeply all the ecosystems of the planet. And, you know, this idea that back Mr. Fuller had of having uh, an operating manual for Spaceship Earth, imagine a, a data platform in which you can know down to the genetic composition of, uh, you know, every organism in a forest in one platform. So these are kind of things that, that we geek out in terms of data and we learn a lot yeah. about the possibilities. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I, I, one more question. So related, uh, I asks, can food forest grown via permaculture methods be a better way to perform agriculture? Yeah, for sure. I mean, agroforestry is uh, a very important practice that I think we need to do more. Uh, if we are going to feed 10 billion people, uh, we need to find more regenerative forms of agriculture. And it turns out, according to data I read, that uh, agriculture inside of a forest can actually produce more yield than traditional you know, monoculture agriculture. So uh, permaculture is another, you know, practice that, you know, has enormous potential. Um, and these are things that, by the way, can also obtain carbon credits. Um, so we hope to help also those projects uh, get additional income through that. Awesome. Diego, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me.